Welcome everyone. I'm Madeline DiNono, President and CEO of the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. I'd like to introduce our ASL interpreters. First up is Romina Mina, and we will also have Darcy French Meyerson. Please make sure to set your Zoom view to gallery if you would like to see them for the entirety of the event. And we also have closed captioning available. Also, before we get started, we would like to acknowledge that the ground beneath our feet is the traditional land belonging to the Tongva Nation. Today and every day, we give respect and gratitude for the Tongva people who remain caretakers of this land. Rosalind Carter, writer, activist, humanitarian, and former First Lady said, there are only four kinds of people in the world, those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need a caregiver. Care impacts all of us at various stages of our lives, which is our focus today. Here to give opening remarks is two-time Academy Award winner, actor, founder, and chair, Gina Davis. Take it away, Gina. All right. Thank you, Madeline. Hello, everybody. Welcome to all of you. We're so happy you joined us for our last event of 2023. I hope all of you enjoy a very happy holiday season. We very much look forward to seeing you next year at our events as we enter 2024 and celebrate our 20th anniversary. Very exciting. I want to start by giving a big thank you to our partners at Caring Across Generations for their ongoing support and for giving the Institute the opportunity to conduct this very important study on the representation of caregiving on TV. Television content created and viewed in the U.S. offers an incomplete picture of how people in this country experience care, leaving many who provide or depend on certain types of care, especially related to aging and disability, feeling underrepresented and undervalued. The study being presented today was undertaken to help us measure the gap between people's real world care experiences and what we typically see portrayed in our mainstream culture and identify opportunities for creators to bring richer, more resonant portrayals of care to the screen. Because TV as a medium has the ability to implement change quickly, our hope is that this report will inspire more rich and diverse representations of caregivers on screen. And on that note, I will hand it back over to Madeline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gina. And now I would love to welcome Dr. Larissa Taran, to present the research for the study. Larissa is the research lead. She is a social scientist who specializes in quantitative research methods. She earned her PhD in communication from the University of Arizona with a focus on the intersection between media consumption, gender, sexuality, and how it impacts young people's behaviors and ideologies. She also holds a bachelor's degree in journalism and a master's degree in communication studies. Her work has been published in several top tier research journals, including the Journal of Children and Media, Sex Roles, and Mass Communication in Society. Take it away, Larissa. Hi, thank you, Madeline. I'm gonna start sharing my screen for our research presentation. So hi, everybody. Thank you so much for attending our research presentation today for our newest report titled Making Care Pop, What We See and Don't See About Caregiving on TV. So what is the value of studying more on caregiving, specifically in the United States? One of the most important reasons has already been established, and that's simply because care is a universal experience, meaning that everyone at some point in their life will either receive care or give care. There are a few important statistics to note when discussing care as a universal experience. Three of them here on the screen. First is that 43 million adults in the United States are caregivers. Second is that 11 million adult caregivers are part of the sandwich generation. 
Caregivers in the sandwich generation care for both their aging parents and for their own children. Finally, the cost of care is impactful to many people's lives. Specifically, 35% of low-income families' earnings go into child's care. So not only is care an important part of most Americans' lives in different ways, but access to care is not so easy to obtain and is expensive as well. In our study, we specifically wanted to highlight long-term care. Long-term care is focused on aging or disabled care recipients. Some examples in your own lives may include perhaps your aging parents or your aging siblings, other family members with long-term care needs or disabled care recipients. Now that we've established the importance of care and more specifically long-term care, how does care relate at all with television? Here at the Institute, we view television as a, as a storyteller that can cultivate viewers' understandings on various social issues, one of them being care. Especially when viewers do not really have an established knowledge or firsthand experience on a particular topic, studies illustrate that television can actually educate them about important events or current events. So television then is a major educator that can establish within our society and our daily lives what is important and what is not important. It can also reinforce or diminish any preconceived ideas that we may have about specific topics. So let's put this theorizing into perspective with two examples. Here we have on the screen two shows that focus on forms of long-term care. One is an older show, maybe you're familiar with it, it's called Parenthood, where one of the main storylines is about a child with autism. Another is a show, Grace and Frankie, a newer show, where one of the main storylines is about two aging women who live by themselves and their children are shown constantly worried about them at different points and they even try to trick them at one point to move into a nursing home. So when a viewer is exposed to these portrayals, this can translate to an attitudinal shift about caregiving, where they may interpret caregiving as important and be exposed to obstacles and realities of caregiving. This can also lead to a behavioral shift where they may start incorporating caregiving behaviors they see on these shows into their own life. As a society, these portrayals could even transfer to greater importance on policies relating to care in the country. So contrarily, if there's a lack of these caregiving portrayals, the opposite effect could occur. This can communicate the idea that caregiving is not important and it's not worth telling stories about care on screen. So there is tremendous impact that we can see in daily life and society when we do see televised depictions of caregiving. So with that, we are presenting three research questions today. The first is, how is care represented on television? Second is, how are care challenges represented on television? And finally, how does television reinforce narratives about long-term care, notably age and disability? To answer our research questions, we conducted a content analysis of all broadcast cable and streaming scripted TV shows that had a prominent caregiving storyline. We only included shows in the United States from 2021, and we found that only 10% of these programs had a caregiving storyline. In total, we included 190 episodes in our sample for analysis. Our first finding for research question one is that care-related storylines were mostly about child care or parents caring for their children, in other words. Less than one third of storylines focused on long-term care, such as aging and disability. So what we can see immediately is that care, de care depictions on television have a one-dimensional view about care, rather than focusing on various other care experiences that don't have much to do with child care. We also found that caregiving is primarily a female act. 
56.5% of caregivers for aging and disabled care recipients were women. Female caregivers were also more likely than male care caregivers to perform complex care tasks. These tasks include things such as managing finances, planning things, managing transportation, shopping, and meal preparation, to name a few examples. They were mostly shifted or geared towards women. When looking at the demographics of actual caregivers on screen, we found that only 53% of caregivers for aging care recipients and 66% of caregivers for disabled care recipients were white. And when we look at the demographics for long-term care recipients, we found similar patterns. Almost 73% of disabled care recipients were white and all care recipients that were 50 years and older and also disabled were also white. So moving on to our second research question, we found that only 7% of episodes had any mention about the cost of care. We also looked at the, the association between care and balancing other components of people's lives. So for example, only 5.2% of caregivers were shown to struggle balancing their care responsibilities and their work responsibilities. Almost 2% of caregivers experienced health impacts because of their care responsibilities. Finally, we only saw 7% of caregivers who were part of the sandwich generation. Here we can see a visual of what these results mean, of uh, the representation of care challenges on TV in Maroon and the real life challenges caregivers report in Teal. So clearly there's a huge discrepancy between the financial strain of care, work care balance, the sandwich generation and health impacts to what is actually experienced by caregivers to what is shown on television. Our last finding for our research question is that less than 1% of storylines showed characters struggling to find a home-based care worker, and only 7.7% of paid care workers were shown working in the home. Our final research question asked about the narratives about age and disability care on television. First is that we found that the minority of disabled care recipients had any sort of agency in their care. 12.5% of disabled adults and 3.3% of non-disabled older, older adults had agency in their care. 8.3% of disabled older adults and 12.5% of disabled adults expressed feeling like a burden because they needed care. Together, these findings suggest that there are tropes about disabled and older care recipients where they don't really have strong options or choices related to care that they need on screen. Based on our findings, we offer five main recommendations. First, our report highlights that these are very uncommon portrayals and that most caregiving storylines are parents caring for their children. We recommend to make home-based aging and disability care more visible. Second is we see a lack of diversity when it comes to marginalized groups in care, such as queer caregivers. We recommend to tell more diverse care stories. Third is that caregiving is a rewarding experience, but it also has its challenges as we covered today. We recommend to show more characters experiencing common care challenges. Fourth, we recommend to show more caregiving activities from basic tasks to more complex ones. Finally, we recommend to model caregiving aspirations. Thank you very much for listening to our research findings. I'll turn it back to Madeline. Thank you so much, Larissa. There's a lot to unpack. And Jasmine just posted this in the chat, but for everyone listening, the report is now live. So. To talk about this a little bit further, I would love to welcome our esteemed panelists, and you all can just pop, pop up on the screen. We have Robin Shore, a TV writer and showrunner. We have 
Andrea Lavant, award-winning impact producer and disability consultant. We have Jacqueline Rivere, care influencer at Mom of My Mom and writer. And we have our wonderful partner, who it's a blessing every day to have her in our lives, Lydia Story, Director of Culture Change and Caring Across Generations. So thank you so much for joining us. And Lydia, I'd love for you to kick us off. Uh, clearly care is something that will impact all of us one way or another. Uh, it's not thought as a critical pressing issue, especially when we think about narrative and storylines. Why is it important to incorporate more authentic representation and just overall representation of care in the world of make-believe? Thanks, Madeline. Um, and we're so thrilled to have been able to partner with you all um, to do this really groundbreaking uh, comprehensive study um, looking at sort of all of the dimensions um, of how care shows up in our TV culture. Um, as somebody who worked in TV, uh, for over a decade uh, before this, I very much um, embrace and uh, respect the power that TV has to help uh, shape the way that we perceive and value um, uh, aspects of our daily life. And I think that's really the answer. Um, we have for so long um, kept care as something that um, is a little bit invisible, something that's done behind the scenes, usually by women. Um, it's not kind of considered to be interesting or have dramatic stakes or be the driver of, of real stories. Um, but what we know at Caring Across Generations is that it really is the stakes of a, a lot of people's lives, millions of people's lives. Um, so to give a little bit of context about who we are, um, Caring Across has for over a decade been organizing uh, people across the U.S., uh, family caregivers, older adults, disabled people, parents, care workers, all under one umbrella to really try to transform the systems and the culture um, of care in this country. Because the thing that we know from all of this work is that, as Larissa alluded to, people are really struggling. People um, are struggling to find care, to access the support that they need. People are struggling to cover the cost um, of the care that they rely on. Um, but more than all of that, people feel really alone in this because culturally care is so invisible. Um, and when the stories do exist, it doesn't feel truly authentic or reflective um, of those experiences. Um, the sense of aloneness um, uh, really keeps people from being able to, to tr truly know what to do, like how to reach out, how to get the support that we need. So I think from a storytelling perspective, what TV can really do is just normalize care as a part of life, care as, um, you know, in, uh, essential in the sort of day-to-day -day experiences of people um, in all of the range of ways that it actually is, um, both to help those who are in it feel very much not alone, also to help us build that cultural value to help break through some of the taboos that we hold on to um, in this American culture um, around age, around illness, around disability, breaking down those taboos, normalizing all of those as totally regular parts of life and care as sort of alongside that. I think just normalizing it um, is a huge step forward. Thank you so much for that. Um... So, you know, clearly the data showed that two thirds of family caregivers were white and disabled characters over the age of 50, even though in the real world, community of colors disproportionately shoulder care responsibilities in the US. So we're talking about not even seeing storylines about care, but also not seeing diversity in care on screen. And how do we broaden that? So. Um, I would love to hear, uh, Andrea, I'm going to kick off with you and then kind of have a walkabout with all the other panelists. Sure. Um, so very grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Um, so it's interesting being in these Zoom boxes because you can't see all of me. Um, but I am actually a, a wheelchair user, a power wheelchair user and have been um, pretty much my entire life was diagnosed with a neuromuscular condition when I was around 18 months. And um, 
So when it when it comes to care and representation, you know, for me, it it is that I still don't see myself, nor have I seen myself um, represented uh, in such a way that, uh, as to the the report um, really says, um, that depicts the life that um, the potential life that I could could have had and even the life that I have now. So I am a, a business owner, a successful business owner. I am married to a woman. So I'm a queer, Black, disabled woman. And so, you know, when we talk about the depiction of, you know, caregivers of color, when we talk about, you know, um, was mentioned even queer relationships, the, the dynamics um, in, in that are, there's so much there and I think as a, a young person what that did and not seeing myself was really uh diminish value um I didn't because when I didn't see myself I didn't see myself as worthy as one that um you know should even really be out in society I had to make my own inferences and and I didn't see potential for what could be um and so you know, I'm grateful to be uh, where I am, but I think that is a significant place where we we really need things to shift. Um, you know, everything from, you know, the parental role. I think that, you know, what we have seen even often when disability is portrayed for folks younger than, you know, the aging community is it still often disability is presented as a white and often a white male um, experience. And so myself, again, as a black woman and being raised in an African-American household, you know, even the parenting and the way that my parents cared for me was, wasn't, I didn't have hovering parents. That's often what we see, you know, depicted. I had parents that were very much about um, making sure that I could move independently and make choices independently and ultimately you know, be out on my own. Um, and I think some of that also just had to do with the culture. Um, and then moving forward into adulthood, you know, what it took, the dynamics of um, the idea of living the American dream as a disabled person and what my journey was um, and what the journey often is, um, even as, as uh, Lydia mentioned and others around um, affording care, um, literally, you know, living in NDC, and that's where I started my career. And as much as I was qualified on paper because I had been to college and all of these things, I still, there were many mornings when I wasn't, couldn't get out of bed because nobody came to get me out of bed. And so I had done all the things that they said, you know, you're supposed to do, um, but I needed somebody to help me get to work. And now, you know, fast forward to now and the dynamics of interdependence is what we, you know, call it, where um, there is me as a spouse, as one leading a company and how we uh, support one another, how we, you know, split household tasks up and how we, you know, are out in the world. And so, um, you know, I think overall what I'm saying here is there's so much depth um, and opportunity to, uh, for storytelling and, and depiction here that really, um, again, uh, it provides not just validation, but it does present the actual world that we live in. Um, and I just see it as there's so many more stories to tell. Absolutely. Robin, I'm going to shift over to you, building on that thread, because, you know, Andrea is talking about intersectionality. She's talking about diversity. She's talking about complexity. Um, and, you know, you have had a lot of shows dealing with families and caring for kids um, uh, and, and very different um, dynamics in terms of nuclear families, non-nuclear families. So uh, can you talk a little bit about um, how this drumbeat of care has worked its way through you know, your shows and how you look at it? Uh, it's a great question. I The first thing that comes to mind was a show that I worked on uh, called The Middle. It was on ABC, I think, from 2009 to 2019, I think. And Frankie, who was played by Patricia Heaton, really was in that sandwich spot. And she had 
she had younger kids and then she had older kids. She had aging parents and she was in Indiana and continually running back and forth. But as I think about the middle and what Andrea just said, the middle had no black people on it. It had no Latina people on it. Like it was, I think that they want, and it, the, I, the middle isn't a show that I created, but I think they really wanted to, to, to depict life in a small white Indiana town. And I think they did that really well, but I think if I could go back with any sort of note to that show, I'd be like, maybe we need to just make it a little bit more diverse. And and I would certainly say the caregivers I've met in my life through my own family have not been white. Um, and so I think I just learned so much from the research presentation. Um, and then I'm thinking about the Carmichael show and that was a show about parents that was definitely more a diverse show about parents, but there wasn't a lot of caretaking stories there. We were going for more hot but button issues, like sexier issues, like shootings and um, uh, all sort of divorce, elder divorce. Um, and then that sort of takes me to now, which is I'm currently supervising a, a pilot for ABC and I believe the creator of the show is on this panel, right? On this Zoom right now, Eugene Garcia Cross created a show called Forgive and Forget, which is about um, a, a man, a dad getting a diagnosis very early on of Alzheimer's and having to rely on his son who he was essentially estranged from and the son has to start taking care of him. So this is all to say that in, in a long career of, TV shows you've most likely never heard of, except for the two I just mentioned. The 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 show that I'm working on right now, and I really hope for so many reasons, especially after hearing all of this, that ABC will give us a chance to make it. Our our we have a memory care therapist on the show. She is Latina. Um, the the family is half Latina. Um, and so we're really trying to weave in these 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 important threads and i think the 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 challenge that we face is not making it sad all the time like we're making a comedy <laughs> so the trick is to do the emotional things about caretaking about alzheimer's but also cutting it with a few jokes here and there so it's a delicate needle to thread so i want to pick up on what uh robin was saying about complex family dynamics. Um, uh, and Jacqueline, I wanna go over to you. Uh, clearly the data shows that there's a lot of challenges that aren't represented like financial strain, this juggling act of not only personal life, uh, but mental health, um, how it impacts the family and also the caregivers that are taking care of the families. So as a caregiver and a storyteller, uh, what type of care experiences and dynamics would you like to see uh, on TV? And what would have helped you if they had been around uh, when you were embarking during your own care journey? Yeah, so I cared for my mom for about six, six years. And also since we're um, talking of about intersections, I also stutter. And so something that was really hard for me was learning how to maneuver talking to doc, doc, who don't see me as someone who sort of um knows what they're they're doing for me seeing characters talk about caring for someone would have mm. 
helped. So have some one um say that they're taking their mom shopping or uh or picking up medic Small nods to the invisible work that we do would have made me feel like someone sees me. You live literally feeling like there's no one like you and that makes you feel non-important and it's really hard to have pride when you just feel like people don't see you so Little nods to care work would be fantastic, but on top of that, seeing a show about people who care, that is what I want. Like, show me care, care, Give first 24 seven. That's all I want. Thank you so much for that. Um, Andrea, I want to go back to you. Um, a, you're an award-winning um, producer uh, for people who may not know um, the amazing uh, movie Crip Camp. Um, I'd like for you to talk us through your involvement with that what was the experience um, being a producer on that? Uh, what was the impact? Um, I know it had a tremendous impact on me, um, but if you can talk us through that experience and the significance of having that piece of work out there in the world. Sure, so I actually served as the impact producer for Crip Camp. So our role um, really came once the film was kind of in the final stages of production. It was, um, and so for those that, that don't know, it's been a few years since it came out. So I have like a, going back, um, but Crip Camp is a, a documentary um, that essentially uh, it is that of the disability revolution is, is what it's, um, and, and the way that it, the journey kind of is depicted is that of a fantastically normal, a uh, group of disabled folks that uh, come together at a camp um, near the Catskills in uh, New York and um, build community and show much of this, this conversation that we're talking about caregiving and what that interdependence looks like as disabled folks. Um, and it's everything from conversations around food to sex and, and everything in between. And, and those um, folks in, in at that camp, along with others along the way that end up um, through multiple kind of events in history, uh, including what's known as the 504 uh, sit-ins um, were, which is the, the largest, uh, one of the, the largest protests actually sit in, our longest, longest protests in history that then led to um, the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so um, my role as impact producer was essentially to take the, the messages of the film um, and present them out in, into the world and honestly help us to, you know, what ultimately we ended up being an Oscar nominated, um, an Oscar nominated film. And I think what was so powerful about uh, that film and what many people say um, and, and it's relevant to this conversation is that it really did normalize um, disability in a way that is 
is uh, continually necessary um, to see that disabled folks have the same needs and desires um, that uh, everyone else has and even still the power of community, what happens when we come together for a common cause and are really able to uh, affect change and, and make history. And, you know, I remember watching it um, for the first time and just being deeply impacted, thinking about myself as a young person and how much having folks uh, around me, how, how I didn't necessarily have disability community and um, to Jacqueline's point, how that builds pride. Um, often when we don't know our history, uh, when we don't know what is going into bringing us to a certain place, we again have this perception um, that we're not worthy or that we're not valuable. And so that's really what that film did, um, not just for our community, but for the world um, at large. It brought disability to the forefront of conversations and honestly beyond just the fact that the film was what it was, what we've seen um, as kind of the ripple effect from the film is there are things like, um, you know, the Oscars that had uh, an accessible stage um, at the Oscars and has continued to do so. We've seen award shows, um, my company included, that supports award shows, that uh, supports studios, that supports companies in a variety of ways um, with accessibility and their inclusion practices on sets and, and, um, and scripting and so on and so forth, um, because, that message was out there in the world. And so I think, again, to speak to our conversation today, that's the power of storytelling is it's not just, okay, we see it and it warmed our hearts and now I have a little bit more information, but it actually um, has the power to change a uh, society at large. And so I'm uh, really honored that I got to be a part of that. And we're so glad that you did. It was just tremendous impact. Um... Uh, so Lydia, I want to go back to you. Uh, we talked about that, you know, 75% of the stories that we do see is really about parents and children, and that's not kind of the, the real world. And we're starting to see um, some storylines about older and disabled people. Um, but again, you know, as Andrea said, as Jacqueline said, uh, even as Robin pointed out, it's a very narrow viewpoint we're not seeing love. We're not seeing romance. We're not seeing these characters live out um, a full, abundant life. So can you talk a little bit more about uh, what you would like to see uh, represented? Yeah, thanks, Madeline. I think um, also to pick up on Andrea's point about the impact being far beyond the like, we, we do see this now. And wow, that was a great story it can truly um, lead toward um, a di like different viewpoints. And I think um, the types of things that we also know as an organization are most people, um, aging and disabled individuals in this country would prefer to remain independent, living at home, living in their community, living with family. Um, what we'd like to see is more depictions um, to speak to one of the recommendations, depictions of that being possible. Um, because part of the not seeing aging and disability care um, sort of implicitly reinforces this idea that, okay, we get old, we have to go, you know, we'll have to be sort of moved into a home or institution. Um, that isn't most people's wishes. So what storylines can do is actually help us imagine and believe that it's actually possible or it should be possible. Um, to have our lives play out the, the way that we all want them to, um, ha remain um, in control, um, have agency and independence um, about how our lives unfold. I think um, to the point about uh, a, a very limited viewpoint, seeing the same stories over and again also um, just, again, reinforces um, this very narrow slice of thinking, whereas depending on the culture you come from, the community you come from, um, people have different value systems around care um, uh, in terms of sort of just cultural value. Uh, but we are only kind of seeing the mainstream 
um, white dominant heteronormative viewpoint uh, of care in the story in the storylines that we do see in terms of long term aging and disability care, which again um, doesn't necessarily reflect the way all people in this country um, consider or, or value care in their own lives. And so it'd be great to sort of see other models on screen um, that are truly authentic and reflective of, um, of different perspectives, just like different perspectives are important um, in all different, in, in um, the way that we talk about diversity and inclusion as a whole um, in, in the industry. Um, the other thing, uh, just very one very um, significant uh, experience that is extremely common. Most people don't actually know in the U.S. that uh, our medical typical medical insurance co um, coverage and Medicare don't cover long term care. So a lot of people find themselves running up against a really uh, significant realization. Uh, and it becomes kind of a crisis when they're like, oh, I thought I was covered, but I'm not, right? So there is a very specific example of how storylines could build drama around a family, a person going through a realization like that, whether it's um, dramatic or even humorous. Um, I think it's amazing to have Robin on this panel because uh, we really believe that comedy is is one of the best ways to kind of uh, address these subjects and, and diminish uh, some of the taboos around these things. So those are just a few examples of the, the sort of big narrative shifts we'd like to see as well as, you know, specific things that could be really useful to people to model in our stories. Thank you so much. So Robin, no pressure. You got to build a writer's room of all kinds of people. You've got to share all these lived experiences and it better be funny. How are you going to do all this? What are the things that kind of spin around in your brain as God willing, um, uh, this show will go fast and furious and we'll all be watching. Oh my gosh. From your mouth to God's ears. I, I want to say really quickly before talking about forgive and forget one of the one of the shows that Eugene and I have looked at a lot in developing the show, um, and I think possibly gets overlooked in the caregiving thing because it was so built into the show, but I think Frasier did an incredible job when they had Frasier's dad moved in with that big, ugly chair, and it wasn't really Frasier taking care of his dad. It was Daphne. Um, so that, I think, was early mid nineties. But I think that was, I think that was an interesting example of uh, weaving it in, in a way that didn't feel like this is the caretaking story. This is the caretaking relationship. It was just like, Oh, it was always fun to see Martin and Daphne in, in stories together. And she was actively taking care of him. Um, but in terms of building a writer's room and, and I, I think like diversity is our number one goal. And I, and I think that comes in many forms. Uh, since we've been developing the show, I've heard from a lot of writers, a lot of white male writers whose whose parents have Alzheimer's. So that's that's an important piece. Um, my mom has multiple sclerosis, so I understand it from a from a limited point of view. But we're really going to want people in there that have the experience of caring for somebody with Alzheimer's or, you know, essentially that. And then also keeping an eye on diversity. So, again, the Venn diagram of those things gets really small and, the you know, you want to be able to draw from a large pool. But when it boils down to it, I think our main mandates will be people who have caregiving experience and and people who have diverse voices that can lend to the show in a way that is constructive and comedic. <laughs> um, because we never want to forget that we're doing a comedy. And one thing that we discovered in pitching the show is that every single, every single network we pitched to, there was some person on the Zoom that was like, I'm dealing with this with my mom. I'm dealing this with my aunt. So we're hoping that ABC doesn't get scared, frankly, of the idea of doing a multicam about Alzheimer's uh, because there have been multicams. The show Mom on CBS was about alcoholism and addiction. Um, there was this comedy on ABC called Speechless, which was about 
uh, the main character had cerebral palsy. So we're hoping that we can really just kind of slide in there and tell the story without, it's, it's tough, tell the story, make it funny, but make it impactful. So I hopefully, hopefully Eugene and I have our work cut out for us in that department. So please keep your fingers crossed. They're making decisions between now and February. <laughs> we will write a, write a letter campaign. Um, Jacqueline, I want to go back over to you because you have very, very successful um, Instagram, Instagram presence through your mom of my mom. Can you talk about what inspired you to create that account? What kind of feedback stories um, are you getting from your uh, from your followers? Um, and uh, and and you've kind of covered the gamut of it. So can you talk a little bit about that experience? Sure. So we started on TikTok, where we have about seven hundred thousand people. And um, now I hear stories every day. People come to me and tell me I'm taking care of my mom. I'm taking care of, of you know, different people. And they come to me and they're trying to figure out the emotional way of maintaining themselves while also trying to show up for the person that they are caring for at the same time. And it is it is a place where I can show up as my full self and, um, you know, truly just kind of uh, share the emotional journey that one will take caring for some someone when you care for your parent the the role reversal is sometimes really hard on you and so helping people manage that and, and um, you know, successfully move through it and help them understand that you are mourning from the time you start caring for them to the time that they are not here. Um, and so just sort of holding people's hands has helped me figure out how to hold my hand also. That's a fan fantastic. Thank you so much um, for sharing that. Um, before we go to Q&A, um, Andrea, I want to go back over to you because um, I spoken to Erin Brown years before she started One in Four. I know you're a co-founder and you mentioned it a little bit, but can you talk a little bit about One in Four and what you're trying to do? Um, I actually think she, she would, they would be great. It's been a while since I've um, been super connected to them, but I know that overall, um, and there's a variety of us in, in, um, in the space, but really it is that, forward momentum, particularly one in four, um, around adding the A when we talk about this diversity, equity, and inclusion. Often disability is not a part of that, and disability in itself is an aspect of diversity. And so, um, and within that is, is accessibility. Uh, and often um, accessibility, particularly in entertainment, is, is an afterthought. Um, it's something that uh, people think about when they're confronted with it. Um, and unfortunately, uh, it's sometimes even in legal form. And so um, really, I know this a significant aspect of one and four and a lot of us in the, the consulting um, area is to help, you know, folks to really think about um, the proactiveness of having, uh, you know, disabled 
people um, and as a part of all that you're doing at the forefront and then particularly in accessibility, like, you know, Robin, um, you were saying, making sure that folks are in the writer's rooms, that they are, um, you know, part of the concepting from start to finish, um, you know, all the way through to when it's time to promote a show. So that's that's really what, what it's about. Thank you for sharing that. So I'm going to invite Jasmine, who's our director of events, to uh, walk through some questions that we have. Sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I do have a few questions. I think I've touched on a lot of these already, but this I thought this was a good one. How would you advise um, content creators to increase storyline and storylines and long-term elder and disability care? Sorry for stuttering over that. <clears throat> I'll jump in. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think that the the impetus comes from the person who has the care story. The impetus comes in our case, Eugene's mother has Alzheimer's in the script. It's it's just, it's the it's the young man's father who has Alzheimer's, so switched in script form. But I think what happens, and again, I, I could be wrong and only referring to my own experience, but if you come in and you say, this is, you know, my mom has Alzheimer's, like you're coming at it from an authentic point of view. I want to tell this story. And one of the things that happened when the publicity went out about this show was people were like, oh, some people were like, oh my God, Alzheimer's is going to be hilarious on TV. And then other people were like, oh my God, thank you. The stuff that I deal with with my mom or with my dad is actually really funny. And, and I think those people really want to be seen. So I would say like even Jacqueline was saying before we started the panel that she wants to be a TV writer and that she's getting so close. And I'm like, we need people like you to tell their stories. Otherwise, like I can't walk in to try and sell a show about cancer. I've not, I've not had cancer. So I could tell a story about my mom having MS. Um, but it all comes, I, it, it's definitely, we definitely need to be hearing from more diverse voices, but in that, in, within that, we want to hear those stories of like, this is what I'm actually dealing with at home. Um, and, and making it, I guess, okay for those things to be on television, <laughs> you know, like, and knowing that people can come to our show or any other show about care and it'll be comforting and it'll be funny and challenging all at the same time. But the trick is really sort of leading with your own authentic for writers to come in and maybe not pitch the story about a glee club, but pitch the story about taking care of their mom as she goes through cancer. It's just, it's just figuring out what the hook is and what your authentic take on that is um, in terms of caregiving. Lydia, do, were you gonna say something? I, yeah, I will add on to that a little bit if, if okay. I think, I think um, it would be amazing. I mean, I hope Forgive and Forget happens. It's gonna be so funny. Um, but I also think that there are ways for these experiences, as Jacqueline sort of nodded to in an early comment, all of this to just sort of be woven into the fabric of more characters' lives throughout more of our TV content generally. Um, you know, one of the things that I've done um, since coming to this role is just kind of watch TV with an eye for where are these, you know, nods and layers and details and scenarios being kind of woven in. So it's not always about being the premise of the story, but how can we realistically kind of just make it a part of more stories? Because, you know, if one in five people in this country are um, uh, providing care to another adult or disabled person in their family, like maybe one in five characters on our screens should also be um, reflected as doing that, not necessarily making it the the focus of the story but just a part of life you know so Jacqueline Andrea did you want to uh add on to that well um sure this is Andrea um I just oh goodness totally where did my train of thought go here um totally lost what I was gonna say it's it's that time of day um yeah hit me just totally lost it <laughs> sorry about that 
Go ahead. No, we'll stay. Jacqueline, did you want to say something? And then we can go back to Andrea. Sure. So, you know, I don't necessarily want someone who has never experienced care to write um, storylines about care. Same way, I don't want someone who's never stuttered to write storylines about that, though it happens all the time and it's not helpful. Um, so I do think that having people who have these lived experiences in these rooms, mm -hmm. sharing what it's actually like will give so much depth to mm -hmm these these stories and my social media has taught me that people are are ready for these sort of stories and so I'm just really excited that the landscape is slowly changing. I also think that there is a culture shift that should start. We fear um, we fear a Gene. And the more that we fear it, the more that we don't want to look at what might have, have been. And so a culture shift needs to start there. I, I, was, <laughs> I was gonna I'm like it came to me what I was um, <laughs> about that I was like I had something um you know I was I was thinking about uh, you know just the nuance of of story I was in development um on something uh and it ended up getting cut because it because of the trend which is around comedy which is amazing and we love it and also there is there is so much nuance in in the care storylines that they're not every single episode always going to be funny. Like, and so I think that um, sometimes what happens is that uh, in the aim to try to to shift the narrative, it can go extremely to one side without the consideration of the of the nuance within story. And and so with this project, it was just like we can make, we can definitely bring in the fun. Disability is fun. And it's also so many other things as well. And so that's why I think it is incredibly important to have, you know, those of us with the experiences um, at the table. So that's, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> Thank you. Jasmine, can we squeeze in one more question? Yes. And I, this one kind of moved me and it's more of a comment, but the could be definitely turned into a question, but this is from Dawn in the audience. Um, she says, thank you for this discussion today. I teared up at the beginning of it because it is the first time in 10 years that I have felt heard. Sorry, make me emotional. Um, I'm a caregiver for my mother who has Alzheimer's and a filmmaker with lots of stories to tell and projects that I am working on. Um, there's an opportunity for lots of incredible and authentic stories, but there needs to be the recognition that filmmakers with these kinds of stories are overburdened already with the expenses of caregiving. I don't have extra money to spend on the things that other filmmakers might be able to handle on their own. Um, even small grants would help, like grants to put a pitch deck together, a sizzle reel, a website. Guess I'm saying that startup funds or development grants specifically geared towards caregiving stories would go a long way towards getting these kinds of stories out there. Um, Fantastic. I yeah. always went to that to say that Me we too. actually just launched a grant for a short film project um, that centers care. So I'm so happy um, if if the Gina Davis Institute, um, if you do any follow up after this, I'm happy to provide that information. It's called the Storytelling with Care Grant. We want to give fifty thousand dollars to somebody to make a project um, as a pathway toward building their career and also 
um, creating a story um, that centers all of these values and experiences that we discussed today. So um, Caring Across is doing that in collaboration with the National Domestic Workers Alliance, Participant uh, Media, and uh, the Hollywood Radio and Television uh, Society Foundation. So um, really spot on uh, question and acknowledgement, and um, we recognize the same. So excited to be able to support that. And hopefully this fund will continue to grow and we'll have other uh, institutional funders uh, and partners uh, joining you. So unfortunately we are out of time. So I just wanna thank all our esteemed panelists. Um, please follow them on social media. In terms of a call to action, the full study is now available and live at cjane.org. Also, um, we will be promoting it on social media channels at Gina Davis org. Please grab it, share it. Um, and for those of you who are content creators or our studio partners, we will be calling you because we would love to present the study to you. Uh, so the more that it's out there, the more that we can influence change. So once again, thank you to Lydia Story, Caring Across Generations. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you. Um, and stay tuned. We're going to have a lot of other exciting things um, happening, uh, coming to you in January. Thanks, everybody. Have a, a wonderful, safe, and blessed holiday.